dressed up for the occasion. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> nice stuff. <laughs> we made fondue for dinner, so I'm actually in a bit of a cheese coma, which was probably a bad choice now that I think about it. So. <laughs> You're like going to fall asleep. <laughs> It caught you at the perfect time. Your mouth was like, <laughs> at fondue. Uh, yeah. I'm like, yeah. I want some fondue. It's just like my whole computer broke when I heard fondue because I haven't had it before. <laughs> yeah, it Way too long. Yeah. yeah, awesome. It's so cool how you do it through Skype and like it's, it's the future, isn't it? Yeah, it's, very it's cool. so cool. And well, also, I've just enlarged you guys. You're huge. Oh, right really? Oh, okay. I'm going to take a photo. <laughs> okay, <carry on. laughs> I'll try taking it away where you can see the cake you Ah, ah, too hard. There we go. Good. How's it going, Gareth? How are you, my boy? <laughs> Good evening, Craig Hayward. How are you going, my man? <laughs> Yes, I'm brilliant, my man. How's your morning been? Uh, it's been really good. Thank you, Brad. Really good. And uh, your evening, how's your day at work? Great, man. We had an awesome chat early this morning with an amazing guest and uh, had a great day in practice. Uh, and how about you? What have you got planned for this morning? So I've just had a good uh, session on planning my new coaching strategy and also working on our, our branding for our podcast and just really excited with the direction that it's actually taking so lots to look forward to for us and for sure. lots to look forward to in this conversation as well we spoke to this amazing young lady alice zaslavsky um, alice is an a jewish immigrant uh, who uh, moved from the ussr and she is now residing in australia she's been there for for 25 years um, Alice is a, a teacher. Uh, she's actually um, an ex-Australian MasterChef uh, contestant, and she finished seventh in 2012 uh, in the competition. She's now an author of uh, kids' food food books, uh, a TV presenter. She's also a food judge, and if you had to kind of summarize her. Overall, I would say you, she, I would say she's a culinary conversationalist and a food literacy advocate. And we got into some really cool topics in the conversation, didn't we, Craig? Indeed, Gareth. And as you mentioned, one of them was being an immigrant to Australia. We also got into some of the ins and outs uh, of being a modern day Jew and what that entails and what that means exactly. We also see where her spark for the culinary arts came from. And we hear all about the behind the scenes of what happens in the Master Chef uh, production. And it's really, really interesting. Uh, we also get into why cooking and food is supporting us uh, as families and as a tool for education. So it was a really interesting chat, hey, Gareth. Yeah, it was indeed, Craig. And also, we also have a little bit of housekeeping, actually. Uh, firstly, we just wanted to say a massive thank you. We asked some of our listeners, or all of our listeners, actually, in an email to provide us with feedback on the podcast and what they thought. And we got some amazing feedback. Like, we literally are so thankful because people kind of are putting their neck on the line in a way and giving you really constructive, well thought out feedback. And it was really like an eye opener for us. And we just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who has replied. We have replied to all your emails too. And it's really been very, very helpful for us. Yeah, totally. And we also uh, just moving on from the housekeeping, uh, you know, Alice has got such an amazing story and she, her whole story originates in the kitchen and you and I have some real fond memories, hey Gareth, of, of time in our homes back in South Africa with our families uh, in the kitchen, hey? Yeah, we do. I just remember that my mom always used to cook great meals. They were always well structured. You'd have your veg protein and carbs and it would always be healthy you know and 
we learned so much from, you know, not, well, we were lucky just to have healthy food, but also just the whole environment and setup of having a meal of, you know, someone had to set the table. Uh, we all had to eat properly. And then, you know, you had to clean up afterwards. These were just great little mannerisms that were put into us by our parents while we were growing up and sitting around the table every single night and having a conversation while eating was so special now that I look back on it. Yeah, those rituals are really, really important actually. And just to be able to connect with your family every day and just have that moment to to hear how everyone is actually doing uh, when it's not so frenetic like getting ready for school or something like that. And you also do learn a lot because I remember getting the odd fork to the to the elbow that was on the on the table or <laughs> or like always asking to pass something instead of just grabbing it and and I still you know still remember those little things today hey yeah definitely those are really good things to learn as a kid and there's nothing like a good set of table manners uh, so <laughs> yeah I think now is a really good time for us to hear what it's like for Alice Saslavsky to be ridiculously human. All right. Well, good morning there, Alice Zaslavsky from Australia. Good evening to you. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. How's it, you guys? Uh, oh, how's it? We love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you've oh, obviously... awesome. How's it going? <laughs> yeah, it's going well. Great to be here. <laughs> uh, cool. You've obviously got some Safa friends there in Australia. Plenty of Safa friends. Yeah, there's a there's a huge um, South African Jewish community um, in Melbourne, in Sydney, and in Perth as well. So, you know, through my throughout my travels, I've met quite a few Safas. Uh, that's cool. <laughs> and we I love to say things people. like "How's it?" <laughs> yeah, "How's it?" and "Lekker." Lekker. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what, what other words have you got? That's about it. <laughs> no, that's good. Come. Those are the most important <laughs> ones. You can call important. everything lacquer. That's good. <laughs> yeah, it, it's one of those words that you can use for so many different things. That's for sure. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> and actually, you also have a, a Rhodesian Ridgeback. Is that right? I do. I do. Yes, we probably so cool. heard him. That was his greeting as well. Um, yeah, he's a he's a big boy. His name's Leopold Tolstoy. Um, but his um, Afri Afri African name is uh, Simba. Simba, Simba, cool. I, I love, I love the name as well. Do you call it? What do you call him? Like generally, Leo. Leo. <laughs> Leo. Oh, nice. Yeah. And why Tolstoy? Why, why? Are you? Have you got a bit? Are you a little bit enamored with him, his work, or? Well, I, I thought he needed a really dignified um, name, like uh, with with Russian kind of leanings, <sighs> and so it was a question of you know which literary figure in in yeah. Russian. Um, literature would I call him and I'm not going to call him Leopold Dostoevsky so <laughs> <laughs> and obviously oh. you know, Leo Tolstoy is his name but and um but not for Leopold <laughs> like <laughs> nice. yeah look when people call their dog things you can't at some point the justification just ends like you can't we just have to go okay yeah fine yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and have you read well, any of Leopold's of books any of Leopold's books, yeah. He's still at the poor painting stage. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, obviously. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, you, you might be able to see in the in the background, there are, this house is absolutely full of books. Um, when we came to, um, probably going a little bit too far ahead, but when we moved to Australia, um, all my parents brought were books and, and records, you know, because my dad's a massive bibliophile. And, you know, from a very young age, it was all about, making sure that I was reading, you know, I read war, and, uh, I read um, crime and punishment in Russian and mm. in English just to oh. check. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I remember, you know, like as a sort of an early teen, my parents would always say, now is the time to be reading this stuff because you'll never have this amount of free time ever again. And I kind of was like, Oh yeah, yeah. You know, when you roll yeah. your eyes at your parents, now yeah. I look back and I think, was I thinking <laughs> they were smart parents it's so true though it, it doesn't it get harder to like just find time to sit down with a book like, it's like come on I find myself there's a there's a half read book in every room in, oh. in my house so yeah and I'll just read like a couple of pages of each 
depending on the mood and depending on the room. <laughs> it's so I've got the exact same habit. Seriously, they all like scattered around the house. I'm like, Gareth, can't you just finish one of them? Seriously. <laughs> I feel like it's the real life equivalent of having too many tabs open. Yeah, <laughs> totally. totally. I actually, this this often actually this afternoon I took a book out because I've just been away in Melbourne. Actually, coincidentally, um, I just got back yesterday and I got a, a book there and I put it on my, my like my bedside table on top of another book that I've only halfway through and I'm thinking, what am I doing? Like, what am I thinking? Like, there's a book right there. Don't because I'm now going to pick this other one up and start on that. I'm like, <laughs> so stupid. Totally. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I honestly do not know um, how I've got a, a girlfriend that gets through like at least a book a week. Wow. And I just have so much admiration for her. But she's, she's one of those people that actually hits deadlines as well. So, you know, <laughs> hands things in before a deadline. Just conchy people. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. And nobody gets up. <laughs> so uh, Alice like if we had to I guess sort of summarize you like in in a few words um at this sort of point in your life you know you're a teacher an author a tv presenter a master chef alumni a food judge a culinary conversationalist and a food <laughs> literacy advocate um so that that's a lot of stuff about food of course quite a few words. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and so, quite a few words yeah. a bit of a tongue twister i'm glad i got through that <laughs> <laughs> Good Good job, man. but but your story is actually very interesting and one that's also common too um with many people and actually quite a few of our guests and you're actually um an immigrant i guess from you know the uh, old ussr um and you i know i'm gonna try my best here yeah, right to say the capital city Tbilisi from Georgia um mm -hmm. now can you just take us back a little bit to you know to this sort of fascinating um childhood and upbringing that you had Tbilisi you know it's funny I think about if you'd asked me that question a couple of years ago before I actually returned to the place in my mind you know in the imaginings of a child it was a really beautiful lush um mountainous um, abundant place and um, I grew up um, spending my weekends at my grandfather's dacha which is like a weekend um, home and I'd be out in the garden with him watching him plant uh, fruits and vegetables and um, I'd get into lots and lots of trouble when I'd pull the roses you know when I'd rip the roses off the stems that was like a classic worst move um, but eating, you know, picking fruit off the tree and eating it in the sunshine. And th those were my memories. And, and I had some really happy times in Georgia. But um, I didn't realize, you know, because my parents protected me from this, that Georgia was obviously in a real state of flux. This was the early 90s. Um, Bidistroika was going on um, in the former Soviet Union. And um, my parents realized, as many um, migrant parents do, that if they wanted a good life, uh, the best life for their children they needed to get out of that country and I think the main issue um, for them you know obviously there were a lot of issues going on politically and socially but um, being Jewish was was something that was stopping them from being able to progress in their own jobs but they also knew that it was going to hold us back and they didn't want that for us so um, you know under the threat of um, treason um, they organized for us to leave and when we flew out of Tbilisi, um, a couple of days later, the airstrip got bombed. Wow. Oh, wow. So uh, the country was very much um, in, a, in a real state. And I went back a few years ago. And the reason why I hesitate and I, I speak about it with, you know, real bittersweet kind of feelings is because those childhood memories are obviously, um, I see it through rose-colored glasses because I think that, that as a child that's kind of what you do but yeah. I, I realize now that you know it, it wasn't normal for soldiers to be marching on the streets and you know for for there to be holes in walls and when we returned and I saw the dilapidated state of this beautiful beautiful country with a rich heritage you know Georgia is the home of wine mm -hmm. they've been making wine there for 6,000 years you know they found Cuevri which is an underground giant um, ampera the wine, 6,000 years old, you know, wow, it's wow. and honey. And it's a real Georgian culture is all about feasting, you know, which had obvious kind of resonance for me. Um, and it's just such a shame that it's caught in the crossfire of a really difficult political climate. 
Jesus. So, so tell us about your parents. I mean, was it a like a fairly sudden decision or had they been planning this for some time? And you said it was under a little bit of, you know, pressure of treason, treason and that kind of thing. Like, how did they go about actually getting their money together and getting out? My um, parents are both academics and um, they, you know, I think that we actually had a, a very privileged upbringing as, as much as we could. My grandfather on one side was an officer in the military who was actually sent um, because he wasn't Georgian or Russian. He was Jewish, which was considered a, a race. You know, that was on my passport wow. as my nationality. Wow. Um, so he was sent to Southern Ossetia to, because, you know, obviously the Georgians and the Russians were very much... Um, um, not accepted by the Southern Ossetians, but as a Jew, he was kind of sent there and, and he was quite high up within the military kind of system. And on the other side, my other grandfather was a head of a factory. So, you know, from that perspective in communism, like that's about as high as, as you can go, really, within the party, you know, you have a lot of privileges, um, but which is kind of why my parents didn't leave sooner, because I think that um, firstly, they kind of thought, you know, maybe things will get better. But on the other hand, they also thought um, when they discussed it with my grandparents that um, my grandparents didn't want them to leave because then the whole family really would be um, tarred by that. And interestingly, mm -hmm. what I found out when we returned is that my, my grandparents did leave. You know, my parents sent for them a few years later. And when my grandfather, who was the head of the factory, left Georgia, um, they actually staged a funeral they said that he died wow no way and right and my family didn't know this for years and it wasn't until you know years later when my auntie <sighs> went back that they said i'm so sorry and she said that never happened so <laughs> no that's crazy <laughs> i know no so but i didn't know any of this stuff you know i i just kind of um to me it was all one big adventure yeah. And I think that was a conscious choice, obviously, on my parents' part, because um, it meant that a, a time that could have been really traumatic uh, was kind of I was I was protected from it. But my brother, my brother was older, so he was he's like nine years older than me, so he was fourteen, and he kind of you know well, almost fifteen, and so for him leaving was leaving all of his friends. You know, neither of us yeah. spoke a word of English, so that was a lot more difficult. Wow. Jeez. And and what was it like um, saying goodbye to your grandparents at the time? Or did your parents just like also tell you some story about that? I think in my, in my memory, in my recollections of that time, I felt like it wasn't goodbye. It was just like, see you soon. Mm -hmm. And, and so both, yeah, my um, parent, my dad's parents came out to, to Melbourne along with my auntie and uncle and my cousins. So they kind of, yeah, they migrated here. Um, and on the other side, they ended up in Israel. You know, like we were actually going, we had all of our you know, bags packed for Israel and it was kind of Australia opened their gates. Uh, and within weeks, my parents made the decision to come to Australia instead. So I could have had a completely different life. Jeez, how crazy is that? I, to, I could have been these folks in the road. Yeah. Right Walking the yeah, exact sliding doors always. Yeah, tell me about it. So, what what was it like being Jewish uh, in Georgia at the time? Was it, was it were there any um, sort of difficulties regarding that? I think Georgia, as you know, as far as the Soviet Union goes, Georgia was actually probably one of the safer places for um, people from from different ethnic cities because it was a place that was quite a, a cultural melting pot. Um, there was a strong Georgian Jewish community as well, but uh, we were Russian Jews that were living in Georgia. So, you know, that had its, its own kind of intricacies and nuances too. Mm. Um, but I have really strong memories of like a, a street party, essentially, for a, a, a Passover once. Um, mm. No, it wasn't Passover, it was um, for Hanukkah. And it was, you know, everybody got out in the street, kind of like a Hanukkah in the, in the park kind of situation with everyone lighting the candles and stuff. And all of that was quite accepted, whereas I think that in the rest of the Soviet Union, having that sort of visible religious practice was very much um, frowned upon. But I do know that um, my parents did still have to try and hide, you know, when they were buying much of the Passover and those things, they had to do that in secret. <laughs> Sheepers. So tough, eh? And so, yeah. 
I mean, before we move on to, I guess, your, your journey into Australia, like, there was a couple of cool things I was reading about, you know, your you and your granddad, like, making food together, um, you made nice preserves, and, you know, that was, like, part of, I guess, your journey into the whole culinary side of things. It's so true. I, I, I think that for a long time, I just assumed that that's how everybody grew up, and everybody had that, that sort of um, access to, and abundance of food in their lives um you know some of my earliest memories of making tomato it wasn't like a passata it was more like a salsa i suppose like a georgian sauce called satsivi and we would kind of come together and use the hand crank <laughs> instead of yeah, the, awesome. uh, pick up tomatoes and the garlic and you know, put it into jars and grandpa made his own wine and um and my grandmother would make dumplings with little like little um bilmeni, like a little press so I think also being Russian Jews in Georgia, I had like this compounded love of different foods because I had Russian food like, you know, blinchiki and um, bilmeni and then I had the Jewish food, so matzo balls and chicken soup and, you know, chopped liver mm. and then I had the Georgian food and Georgian food, you know, is probably the one that, that um, your listeners would be least familiar with for now. Um, I reckon Georgian food is the next Mexican food, just quietly. Oh, wow. uh, because it's very veg-centric, it's very flavoursome. Uh, it's kind of, it's very peasant style, but there's just always so much flavour in it because they love garlic, they love coriander and spice. And um, there's a lot of eggplant. <laughs> and there's one dish in particular that hopefully you all know. And if you don't, seek it out in your city. It's called khachapuri and it's a Georgian cheese pie. Mm. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah. said dinner. It's all sounding pretty <laughs> darn amazing to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and there are like twenty six different types of sachapuri. So depending on what part of Georgia you're in, it could be a different kind of dough or a different kind of cheese that's used. But it's basically like a pizza pie, I suppose, where they um, and it's like melty, stringy cheese. And the best sachapuri I've ever had was when we went back to Georgia. It was up on the hill in Tbilisi, and it was called sachapuri nashampuri, which translates loosely to um, cheese pie on a skewer and mm. it's the sort of skewer that you that you use for a kebab right or a shashlik and it was over hot coals so it was kind wow. of like damper yeah this gorgeous charred dough and on the inside stringy melty cheese mm. is it uh, is it only cheese or is there like a uh, meat or something like that in there as well it depends on the region there's one type of khachapuri where they actually crack an egg into the middle kind of like a shakshuka and then they bake it and so the egg is still runny and you sort of like can mush the egg up into your cheesiness oh, yeah. so <laughs> it's kind of like, a, like an edible plate <laughs> i've just had dinner too and i'm like already hungry again oh. <laughs> just about well i haven't had breakfast and my tummy's not grumbling so <laughs> no, I'll send you the recipe. Yeah, please do but, but we, we can discuss this because uh, it's uh, after five o'clock here but gareth can't so what, what's the wine like there Are you did you grow up uh, i mean you were young obviously but um is that part of very much part of the culture there as well as uh, a wine culture Absolutely. Um, well, being a place where, you know, the birthplace of wine, Georgian wine is some of the most complex wine in the world and, you know, has some of the oldest grapevines in the world. There's one winery in particular called Pheasant's Tears that's actually um, owned and run by an American, uh, John Werderman. But to me, Pheasant's Tears is the most delightful expression of Georgian wine because he, he um, uses Amphora and it's kind of... Um, got a really fantastic depth to it if you can seek it out they do send it around the world um but so it's saperavi which is like the traditional red wine um and then you might be able to find kind of I can't, my georgian's pretty rusty <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's the white wine but my dad um still he's such a he's a winophile as well he's a collector he just loves stuff but um <laughs> but he collects wine and um I, I still, you know, am, am yet to convince him actually that Georgian wine can be good because for a while there he was going to Moscow and bringing back Georgian wine. And what they were doing, because it's, it's un, um, there's, what, what would I say, it's pretty unscrupulous over there. So they were just filling it up with like coloured water uh. I suppose, and selling it to unassuming tourists and, you know, they'd bring it back to their countries and drink it and think oh Jordan wine's not that good <laughs> 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 but it's not true Jordan wine can be good 
but uh, but they're definitely good businessmen that's for sure they make lots of money <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah let's talk about uh, your move to australia you know you arrived there as a youngster with zero english i mean that must have just been so daunting or what, you know, what were your thoughts or did you have any, or did you go into a community? Like, uh, what was it like? I think the hardest thing for me coming into a country where I couldn't speak the language is I'm a communicator. You know, um, being understood is what I thrive on and connecting with people is what I thrive on. So I definitely, even though I was very young, I think I found that really difficult. And it's probably been something that has, um, that's stuck with me. I think it's always, probably driven me to try harder to connect with people and it's given me an empathy um, for those people who aren't understood necessarily at first you know um, because when I came here I had a you know a bowl cut and not a word of English so I <laughs> definitely you know people just assumed I was a boy uh, <laughs> I like to love playing people at lunch and, and stuff and I'll always remember you know my earliest memory of, um, of school in Sydney actually we moved to Sydney first for six months was um, being sat in front of the TV and watching play school all day because there was no ESL program. There was no English as a second language program at that point. And so me and the three other ESL kids would just sort of dance around the chair and, you know, see what was going on through the round window and those sorts of things. So I think, um, you know, I learned I learned the language by watching TV, actually. Wow. Um, so that's why sometimes people say, you know, are you American? Because I've got a little bit of an accent and that's just because I watch too much daytime television. <laughs> the Bold and the Beautiful. <laughs> oh, The Bold and the Beautiful. Jeez. Oh, my goodness. I grew up on that yeah. as well with my I mom. I can remember that as well. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> yeah, and, and then, um, oh, yeah. No, no, carry on, sorry. And then moving to Melbourne, my first day at school in Melbourne, I remember, like, vividly, seeing one kid turn to another and whisper and I still like I'll never know what they whispered but I like assume that it was just like he looks he looks weird whatever it was that they said like that little image has always stuck with me it's just it's you know it's funny you just don't think about the stuff that affects you but definitely yeah I've got to let that go <laughs> I will at some point <laughs> do you have do you have any recollection or do you know who that kid is nowadays no idea, but I, I, I wish them all the best. Ah. <laughs> and and what, what do you mean? Is like you like you've held on to that moment in what sort of way? I think um, I think that that has driven me to build rapport, um, probably to a fault, I guess, because I've wanted so um, the, the little kid in me, little Alice, wanted so much to be liked and understood that that has pushed me. Um, to kind of, in every situation, try to make sure that I was, um, that I wasn't being whispered about, I guess. And when I say, you know, that that's something that, that I need to let go, it is actually something that I've let go because throughout the process of MasterChef, you know, you're physically or you're literally being judged um, and you, you need to build up a thick skin and you need to recognise that somebody else's opinion of you is actually not, like, that's not gospel. And it shouldn't affect the way that you see yourself. Tell me about it. What what was the <laughs> what was the kind of advice and what was the talk that your parents had given you uh, as a kid in a new country? I think the thing that my parents um, made sure of is that we never felt less than, and we never felt like we were um, going without. Even though when we first came to Australia, my parents, you know, when you say how did they get the money together, they had to borrow the money um, to get from, they, they flew from, they only had enough money to fly from Georgia to Singapore. And when they got wow. there, they hoped that they would be able to borrow the money from a friend and a friend, um, actually a friend, someone that they're still friends with in Adelaide, lent them the money to fly us from, from Singapore to Melbourne. Or to Sydney. Massive thing. <laughs> right? And so they came here. With nothing, nothing aside from all the books and records that Dad brought <laughs> over, just pots and pans. And we lived um, above a shop in Bondi, um, and you know, with the Russian Jewish community that was kind of around that area. And my earliest kind of memories of going shopping was walking the streets on hard rubbish nights and seeing, you know, what toys were being 
thrown out. And because Bondi is such an interesting area, you know, you've got the migrants, but you've also got the affluent kind of um, beachfront properties. So I was going home with, you know, almost full board games and jigsaws and toys. And, you know, we'd get bags of clothes from Jewish care that were kind of like, you know, leftovers from, from families who'd grown out of it. And that was, you know, there was like one dress in particular that they gave me. I, I loved that dress. I wore it, well, you know, it was holy. So, um, and that wasn't weird to me. It, it didn't feel like that was fun, I suppose. I think they always made it into a game. Um, and... I think that, yeah, growing up in that state of um, making do with what you had is, has, has stayed with me. You know, I'm not driven by money. <laughs> yeah, that's so important. That's, eh? that, it's, yeah. it's, such a, it's such a cool thing, like, you know, being a kid, you just, whatever happens, you just go with the flow, you know what I mean? Like, and we only sort of amazing. get these worries when we become older, which is in a way kind of sad, eh? Yeah, well, I think it's about context as well, isn't it? Like, I think that my parents made a, a big deal of turning it into a game. You know, what did you find in that pile? And instead of saying, yeah. oh, you know, we're we're down in the dumps, maybe, you know, we can't afford this, but maybe you can find it in that pile. So it's, you know, it's all about delivery, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I also love the fact that, that you can remember that dress so vividly and it's such a special memory for you. I just think it's so cool that if we – Sit, all sit back for a moment. We all can probably have a thing that we remember in our childhood, and and it's a simple thing. It's not necessarily a big thing that we worry about nowadays, hey? No, yeah, I think that um, that's something that we as adults and um, educators need to recognise as well with kids is that the smallest little um, motifs or images will stay with them for life. So we've got to be careful. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I can actually remember for me as well as a kid, I used to have this like yellow outfit, like it was almost like a, a vest. And like then, a but, onesie? No, not a onesie, but it, it was like shorts and a vest and it said K-O-D, but it didn't, I don't know what it stood for. And I was devastated when I eventually realized that I don't have this thing anymore. And I'm like, what happened to that, mom? Like, why did you get rid of it? So I know exactly oh, what you so mean. <laughs> that's classic. Oh, that's classic. Mm. So your, your parents, uh, as you said, were academics and they also traveled a fair bit. Is that right? And you, mm -hmm. you did you travel yeah. a lot with them too? That was cheaper for them than getting babysitting for me. So uh -huh. <laughs> within sort of <laughs> within a year of, um, of of coming here, my parents had found work um, wow. and packed us into a station wagon driven to Melbourne because they'd found work at Monash University. Um, and they, um, as part of their role as academics, they did a lot of traveling, you know, to conferences around the world. And because I was kind of, you know, eight nine years old they figured we'll just take her along because it's kind of you know trying to find someone to look after her for a month uh, yeah. just too much trouble so hey worked out great for me yeah. <laughs> i got to go to you know all all parts of the world and i also learned how to um kind of be self-sufficient because they'd sort of go off to the conference during the day and i'd spend the day um, either hanging out in the hotel room or depending on the place how safe it was kind of exploring the the vicinity of the hotel so um, obviously got to eat a lot of interesting food as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, and were you with your brother at this stage? Was he like, were uh, you, no, were so you a bit older by then? Because he was older, he was sort of 16, 17. So he was going through his VCE um, or his kind of final years of study. So he would stay back and look after the house and, and I'd just sort of kiss off and check <laughs> 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 out. Which, you know, looking back now, like I, I got so lucky there. You know, poor Stan having to be off studying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And so, so did your folks, were they speaking English? Like, I mean, did they speak English when you arrived? Like, how did they get a job at the university? Um, so my grandmother um, on my dad's side was an English teacher. Oh, so oh, wow. Georgia. So my parents had both studied English. Um, and dad actually was, you know, he, he's he got photographs of him in the big, like, you know, when computers were ruined. Yes. So dad yeah. was yeah, when that was happening. Um, so I think that when it comes to speaking that sort of language, that, that, that language is universal. You know, binary code is universal. That's so true. they were able to communicate sort of globally. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, they've both got thick accents, but their level of expertise is world class. You know, they still get 
sent around the world to keynote conferences now. You know, my um, dad's a lead scientist and my mum's a you know director of the knowledge management program. So they're kind of you know dad's working on smart cities. Like he was there, like he he was writing um, algorithms, like Google algorithms and putting them, like Google style algorithms, I should say, and putting them out to, you know, open source with his students around that wow. same sort of time. Like, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting to have seen the internet growth through their lens, yeah. um, but they wow. still think I'm a monkey on a computer. <laughs> 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 I just got no idea. I've got this like weird talent where if I sit on dad's computer, I freeze it. I don't know how, but it just happens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's classic. Uh, but tell us, what is knowledge management? Like, how does that fit into the scheme of things? Knowledge management is um, the art of using data, really, to um, empower and enrich, I guess, um, and also understanding, like, okay, let me try that again. Like, I should just call my mother. That's the answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but Phone a friend. Actually, yeah, find a friend. That's right. I think yeah. like when it comes to all those university academic words, they kind of they use the fancy words, right? But she works a lot um, in health informatics, which is like using health data to help empower people to um, kind of let's say understand more about um, breast cancer, for example. So she works right. on building the breast cancer portal so that people can get all the information that they need. Or you know, most recently, it was a PCOS portal that she built, and um, it's a really interesting field. Yeah, and that, she also works. Um, in the field of, um, for example, helping use Twitter to identify um, emergencies and then inform the paramedics, you know, to come to an emergency before anyone even makes a call. Like that's, that's and that's incredible. a pretty good example. example. Um, but that's because we don't really talk work. <laughs> when we when we hang out, they've given up on me. <laughs> oh, that's <cool. laughs> Stay off dad's computer and we're not going to discuss that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, what's interesting though is that as I've gotten older and especially with my latest project, Phenomenon, that is utilizing, you know, digital technologies in order to help people and empower teachers. So, you know, they've been really helpful in terms of, understanding how to harness technology, but also in terms of understanding how to work with research and development corporations. So that the project was funded through um, Hort Innovation, who look after the growers of Australia. And so it was through the vegetable fund, vegetable growers, that this project came about. And so as part of it, you know, we obviously had really strict mandatory reporting and milestone reports and things. And that's like mum and dad's bread and butter. So they were just mm -hmm. like all over and you exactly, you know, the words that we needed to use and they helped so us a cool. lot. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, so, sorry, I, I know I'm, I, I don't even know what the, the name is, but um, in the Jewish culture, you guys uh, normally catch up like on Friday nights and oh, yeah. you go to whosoever's house it True. is and yeah. you, you basically you, you'll go in and as you walk in, you leave your phones sort of, you know, at the side and everyone just sort of catches up and there's no distractions it's such an amazing and important thing. Um, is that something that you still do to this day? So Shabbat dinner is obviously Shabbat. something that, um, yeah, that lots and lots of um, Jews kind of um, celebrate around the world. Uh, for my family, we don't really have like a, a strict Sabbath practice. We don't <laughs> we don't put our phones away on a Friday night, um, but we do come together as a family, and that's something that's really important to them. Uh, but I have to say, like, that's something that my husband, Nick, and I do try and kind of um, implement every now and then is like a phone-free night or a phone-free day because it makes such a difference. And, you know, um, living, we've lived around the sort of Jewish areas in Melbourne and seeing families walking together, you know, without the kids in their cell phones and, mm. and without the parents kind of checking appointments and things and having conversations, like, that is invaluable. And I think that that's something that ritual is something that you don't need to, to be religious to, um, sure. to try out in your own life. Yeah, totally. I, I think mean, ritual yeah. is so important. Like there's so many mm -hmm. things like that that I think we could uh, instill. And like you say, oftentimes if you are secular, you tend to maybe like shy away from – or not, not shy away necessarily, but just you just don't have any of those rituals necessarily instilled in – in a sort of a secular family, which I think is often lacking. I totally agree with you. Is just to make that time to do good things, like we're going to mm -hmm. sit down together, have a meal together, or whatever it may be, put our phones away, 
Um, and I wonder how we can maybe, um, you know, instill more of that in our in our day to day lives, because I guess something we'd like we obviously want to get onto in this chat is the fact that, you know, you're trying to educate kids and adults alike about having more time together as family around around food. Mm. Well, I think um, something that really comes to mind talking about that idea of secularism and, and religion, religion and um, ritual is that we just need to give ourselves permission. That, I think, is the first place to start because often, you know, if you don't have a family practice or, you know, if you don't have those traditions, you can feel like it's not your place or you don't deserve them or you don't know where to start, I suppose. And I don't yeah. think that you have to label it all the time. You know, most interesting, uh, most recent podcast that I was listening to was talking about the idea of yoga as ritual, you know, and, and where does the line, like spiritual versus religious, you know, everybody can have a connection with spirit in some way. You don't have to give it a name, you know. Um, the kind of Judeo-Christian faith, um, if you grew up, with that, I know for myself, I went to a religious Jewish day school and um, we were kind of taught that, you know, it was all or nothing. You know, there was this kind of um, level of, you know, you're, you're either you're in or you're out and this is what mm. makes you a good Jew and this is what makes you a bad Jew. And the older I get, the more I'm just like, you know, screw that. Yeah. Like I know what, I know what my like connection with, with spirituality is. And I know that in order to be a good Jew, it's actually about the way that I treat people. It's not about whether I eat bacon or not, you know. So <laughs> I think <laughs> sure. that, um, you know, and that's something that, that, that's taken me a while. And it came about because, you know, coming into the public eye and being recognizably other, you know, um, being Jewish, you know, being a migrant, all of these sorts of things, I felt the responsibility of representing those different kind of aspects mm. of myself and those different communities and for a while there I thought you know do I deserve to to be called that or do I deserve to be up on a stage for example I hosted two and a half thousand women baking challah which is like a, a plaited bread which you eat on, on um, Friday night and that's something that in religious homes is a ritual that the mother and the daughter do together it's not something that I grew up with and I asked myself do I deserve to be here am I an imposter and I realized that, you know, the reason that I'm up on that stage is because there's no one that can hold a crowd like I can, you know, and I'm going to bring this party to this room. And I got to bring my mother along and she and I got to bake color together for the first time in Amazing. our lives, you know. Uh... I'm like, if I, if I had said to myself, you know, you don't deserve to be here or, you know, someone's going to judge you in that audience, I would have missed out on that opportunity. So wow. I think we just to, like, just let go of the labels and do you. Yeah, I totally agree. I love that. Very important. Eh? And <laughs> so you're obviously, like you said, you're in, in the limelight uh, quite a bit now. Uh, but just, yeah. just taking it back a, a little bit, before, before that happened, you were actually a school teacher. Um, you taught history and geography, is that right? And you were also, yeah, the, you were also, the, deputy, <laughs> you were also the deputy head of humanities yeah, at a private uh, school in Melbourne. And mm -hmm. one of the very interesting things and stories that I read is that, you know, you love to bring uh, food to school. And one of the things that you brought was a suckling pig. Now, uh, th that's quite classic, <laughs> being, a, being a Jewish uh, lady and you bringing suckling pig as well to class. Like, how did that go down? I told you, I'm being me. I'm being me. The context, thank you very much. Was that it, it wasn't was bacon, and... really. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't fit work. It was baking, that's for sure. Um, so the reason why I brought the suckling pig was because part of my role as the head of humanities was to organize kind of incursion days for the students. And uh, the year eight study medieval history. So I thought, what better opportunity uh, for them to connect with the, the culture of the medieval times and to have a big medieval feast. And so all of the students had to bring a dish. If they didn't bring a dish, they couldn't participate and they had to make it themselves. Um, obviously, a lot of them had brought loaves of bread and bunches of grapes. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't have loaves of bread. But, um, but the suckling pig was really because, you know, those images that you see of paintings from medieval times, uh, those big yeah. triumphant kind of beasts. And um, I bought an organic, ethically sourced suckling pig, which, you know, blew out the budget. But if I'm going to, you know, give the kids an experience, I'm going to do my oh, best awesome. to make sure they get the best, yeah. you know, the best quality. Um, 
And that was certainly a memorable day. <laughs> I'll never forget it. And <laughs> neither will the. So, so what are the, some of the other little dishes that some of the kids came up with? You know, it was funny. I think that um, when I say grapes and loaves of bread, that was honestly quite a few of them did that. But then yeah. others brought things like, um, you know, there was um, bread that had been soaked with mead, for example, mm. or like a, oh. uh, obviously not the alcoholic mead, but just yeah. because that was a dish that was kind of used to break down stale bread. Um, you know, some oh. of them brought little dishes because, you know, they'd done the research and they'd seen that that was a delicacy, you know, to, oh. to have any salt. So, you know, I think that they were able to connect with the, the time and with the history in their own way. And I think that when we empower kids to actually do their own research, they'll remember that stuff a lot more than if we just feed it to them as chalk and talk in class. Yeah, 100%. Love that. Yeah. So, yeah, I love it. And, and like, I mean, it must have been so cool being one of your students, you know, like I can imagine that they that they just love coming to class. They look <laughs> forward to it so much because we all have that teacher, right? Like that we remember from school, like that's yeah. that literally got the message across. And it was generally in in a different sort of way. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like you were that teacher. I hope so. You know, that was something that I came into class every day and I told myself that I had the capacity to change a life, you know, at least one life every single day. Or, you know, the 30 kids that I saw in that day, every single one of them, I could, you know, plant a seed that will stay with them forever. And I think that um, you'd be surprised. I would say that most teachers walk in with that sort of sense of responsibility. You, know, you don't wow. become a teacher for the paycheck or for the holidays. That's for damn sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, you're right, you know, it usually, it usually is because there's been a teacher that's changed their life. Um, I know for me, my grade six teacher, Mr. Rudolph, he was like no other teacher I'd ever had. You know, he'd walk into class. We didn't have textbooks or exercise books that were labeled. We just had, it was called My Everything Book. And so he'd walk in and he'd say, today we're talking about um, the Sultan of, um, <laughs> the Sultan. <laughs> and then he'd say, you know, the Sultan's wife is called a Sultana. Now, I want you to illustrate that or, you know, and we sort of we decorate cool. these books and create our own textbooks. And um, he taught me to think laterally about life and to glean as much knowledge as I could and kind of be a bit of a, a knowledge magpie, I suppose. So cool. But, you know, as part cool of dude. part of you, like taking making that decision every day to change someone's life. I, I guess we've all had those teachers as well that we remember that really hurt us, like, that you really felt like, you know, had been hard done by, by that teacher. And I guess that's the power that, that teachers have is it can, it almost has to be a decision each day. And, and it's, I guess it's so important to, to find that inspiration. What, what inspired, what inspired you at the time? Uh, just the idea of you being able to change a life or. I think it goes back to thinking about my own childhood and thinking about my experiences at school. Um, of coming here, of not speaking the language, of, you know, um, having to kind of fend for myself. I had the empathy of recognising that every student had a story beyond the homework that they handed in and, the you know, when they answered a question and when they chose to hang back. Um, I think that you kind of do get caught up. You know, we have so many responsibilities when we're teaching that go beyond the classroom, reports, exams, parent-teacher interviews, you know, the staff room politics the rigmarole of, you know, upper middle management. But at the end of the day, I think if you get caught up in all of that stuff and you forget that, that, that there are sponges that are literally in front of you yeah. and that you are, you're it and a bit for them, like that's, I, I can't, I can't even describe to you um, how upset it makes me to think that there are students that have a negative experience. And I think that sometimes actually, um, you need to unpack it for yourself. Like if you had a bad experience with a teacher, was it because, um, was it something that that teacher did or was it perhaps that the teacher believed in you so much, you know, like you say that the teachers are toughest on the students that they have the most kind of um, belief in their potential for or, or whatever it is, you know. Um, you know, people have different love languages. <laughs> Maybe they've got yeah. different teaching languages too. But you're right. I think that um, especially... The way that kids are now, it's really, really important that we learn to connect with them on their level. They're very different to when, even when we were kids. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
I'm so glad that you are still teaching and that kids can, in my own way yeah in your own way of, <laughs> yeah. of course in your own yeah. way and, and that you know that you have an influence on on youngsters because yeah. the world just needs like awesome people like you you know what I mean people that are charismatic that think of the background of the kids you know where they're coming from mm. and sort of accept them for who they are it's just like that's so important you know what I mean um it must have been a, a tough decision for you to have to give up your role as a teacher I assume yeah, <laughs> um, it's funny how that came about, actually. I was teaching an elective. Um, I'd noticed I'd been going off on school camps with my year eights and I'd seen that they really didn't, first of all, they definitely didn't know how to cook. Um, that was part of the camp was cooking for ourselves. They had no idea, like they couldn't even cut an onion. Um, but they didn't even know like what these ingredients were or what you could do with them. And, and I recognised that, that something needed to be done, but the curriculum in Australia is such that, you know, the focus is on numeracy and literacy and, you know, STEM, um, that there's not any room for food education in the way that we were taught it. You know, we had home economics once a week. There just isn't that room anymore. So what I thought is that the year eights have an elective opportunity every year where they have like a week where they can do whatever or two weeks where they can do whatever they want to do. So I suggested like a food and culture elective. And I was told that I needed the, um, I didn't have the expertise and I wouldn't get the numbers. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll show you. <laughs> so I went off and I did, a, I did a step at home course, which was like every weekend for a year, uh, essentially, or 16 weekends for a year of learning, you know, sources and um, how to cook different cuts of meat and how to identify different herbs and all those sorts of things so that I had the expertise. And at the end of the course, really like as we were receiving our certificates we found out that they were auditioning for master chef in that same venue and they were looking for people with personality who could cook and i'd not really watched the show and i definitely not thought about auditioning for it but i figured you know if i go on the show like i've heard my kids talking about master chef so they'll see me on tv and they'll be like oh my god you see uh he's got this really cool food and culture elective i'm gonna do it (laughs) so you know (laughs) <laughs> and then I auditioned. I didn't really expect to get in. Like, I, you know, people say that all the time. I really, I just didn't even think about it. I just auditioned. And when I found out that I was in the top sort of 100, I approached my um, heads of school and said, you know, I've got, I've finished all my reports. I've finished all my exams. It's three weeks out from the end of the year. Um, so can I have, you know, these last sort of three weeks off to, to go on, on this adventure? And they said, you know, we're with you all the way. And I thought, wow, that's awesome. So yeah. I went off and, you know, a week into this process, I'm still not in the top top 24. Um, and I email and say, you know, thank you so much for your support. Um, I'm still in, you know, not sure what's going on, but it's really amazing. Um, and I got a, a response that, you know, if I wasn't at work on Monday morning, I didn't have a job. <laughs> it's all well and good that you're having fun, but if you're not at work on Monday morning, you don't have a job. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, at that point, you know, that was a Sunday night. Um, I was at my best friend's wedding. Uh, they let me out of lockdown to go to this, to be a bridesmaid at my best friend's wedding. And I'm, you know, speaking to my then boyfriend, now husband, sort of saying, you know, what am I going to do? And I think that at that point, we realized that, you know, this was another sliding doors moment. It was another fork in the road. Wow. And I knew that no matter what, you know, I could find a job teaching, but this opportunity wasn't going to come around again mm. with, with Master Chef. So, uh, the next day, I, I didn't respond to the email. I just didn't turn up to work, um, oh. which I'm sure they assumed I wasn't doing. <laughs> I, uh, I was going to do, and I didn't tell my parents. <laughs> you can imagine how they would have responded. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, we brought you to this country. We, we, <laughs> yeah. we brought you through. You know, it was really, and the thing is, you know, I was the youngest head of humanities. You know, I was 26. I could see a really clear leadership trajectory within a top-tier school, Um But Mm. I also knew that whatever, you know, I'm a yes person and I always take the path less traveled because, you know, that makes for much funner stories. So I walked into the MasterChef kitchen and um, behind us walked Matt Moran, who's a top chef in Australia with salmon, with big salmon on his back and all of his sous chefs with big salmon and, and slammed them down on the bench and said, today you either step forward and you cook and you go home or you get an apron when you step back and you cook another day. And I figured, well, I don't have a job. Um, so if I, you know, go home today, then, you know, what have I got to lose, basically? So I stepped yes. forward, I cooked 
and I got into the top 24 that day. Wow. Wow. We well done. You That's cooked amazing. your heart out that day. <laughs> right. And I, and I cooked, it was actually a, a fish um, consomme with like a bagel. It was like um, smoked salmon bagel, but reinterpreted. So like a salmon consomme and like a, a bagel, little croutons and like a really gorgeous salmon fillet and, you know, creme fraiche. It was delicious. Um, and once I got the apron, that's when I told my parents, oh, yeah, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dropping this bomb on you. <laughs> I'm dropping this bomb. <laughs> And what was their reaction? Uh, I think by now, you know, my parents knew what kind of a person I was. And it's funny, <laughs> actually, when my mum turned um, 60 in her speech, she said um, that she's proud of me because I always do the things that she never had the courage to do. Wow. Which was like, <gasps> I mean, yeah. it was just like weeping. Um, because, you know, I think that that's, that's what they've done for me. They've, they've given up so much to, to give me every opportunity. And I'm just going to seize every day. Seize that cup. <laughs> cup wow, that what, a, what a way to live. That's amazing. It really is amazing. Yeah, and and it's, it's, just briefly, it's, like, it's, I've it's, always it's, wondered, like, you get onto a show like that, you're not a, sh like, you're not, you haven't been to chef school, you know, at that stage or anything like that. You, you're just kind of a, a decent cook kind of thing. Is that, is that right? And then how do you like know what any of those things are? Like, how do you go in there and go, oh yeah, I'm just going to make a, I don't even know how to pronounce what you just cook. You know, like, <laughs> well, I think, how does the, that work? I think, yeah, the thing that sets MasterChef apart and MasterChef Australia in particular that makes it such an international juggernaut is that the audition process is so rigorous. And they really, they select the people that like are beyond food nerds. Like we, the way that we spoke about food in the house was just crazy. And, you know, when you're not cooking, you're back at, at the house reading cookbooks and studying and, and learning as much as possible or practicing. Um, so if you walked in, you know, a pretty good, you know, amateur, you walked out a pro-am kind of <laughs> person. Yeah. Wow. So, but they they definitely they make sure before you even get in front of the judges they make sure that you can cook like i think one of the first questions that they asked me in the cold dish audition which was like the first one in front of the producers was what oil did you use for your mayonnaise yeah, and a, an, an amateur cook is going to use olive oil because they just assume that any oil is fine and that's what they've got but a, a cook that understands flavor will use a neutral oil like grapeseed, for example, because that's going to make sure the mayonnaise isn't too strongly like oil, oil, olivey mm. tasting. Um, and so, you know, that was kind of like my do or die, blue pill, red pill. So when I said, you know, grapeseed oil, <laughs> the experience producer was like, hmm, that is good. Yeah, <laughs> you can go <laughs> through. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, what else was funny in that, in that very audition is that you could tell that they were trying to figure out what box to put you into, what what was your, what's your shtick? And so for me, one of the questions was, you know, so do you cook a lot of Jewish food? And like, I want to tell you now, I did not cook <laughs> any Jewish food. Like I, I was like an Italian and I wasn't like, I, I, I grew up um, especially feeling like I was such a fish out of water at that religious school and being told that I, you know, wasn't enough. I grew up, especially at uni saying, you know, I'm Jewish. You know, I'd make a joke out of that. So I'd, in a way, I'd kind of, I told myself that, you know, I didn't deserve to cook Jewish food. You know, it's not something that I just thought that I could do. So when he said that, you can imagine what my answer was. Oh, yeah, yes. of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any other type of food? <laughs> then I had to study up for a week. <laughs> Wow, that's fascinating. so. So, can you just like give us a bit of like you know sort of insight into what it's like uh, you know being on MasterChef? Uh, you know, like you mentioned there, you're on lockdown. You guys are all living in the same house. What other cool things? I mean, I was reading one thing about the food that's served on the show. It's actually cold, but they tasted hot beforehand. So many crazy things that they do for a production, aren't there, isn't there? Well, that's the thing, you know, it's a really, it's the, the production values of the show are second to none. And you just have to think like logically, by the time that they get every shot, that food is not going to be warm, but the judges want to give you your best shot. So they taste all of the elements warm. And, you know, if you're a smart contestant, you're going to have everything. Um, you're going to make a second plate so that the judges can taste that off camera. But mm -hmm. their poker faces are so strong that like, there's no way that you could ever tell that, you know, wow. whether they like the dish, 
so they don't they just walk away but you know that yeah. that's like it's funny when people find that out it's like such a massive surprise but if you google it it's really all over the internet it's not you know it's not rocket science but um in terms of you know an insight into the house people always wonder why we're so sad and you know or why you know you're crying at a drop of a drop of a tart or whatever it is um, but the fact of the matter is that the, pro the whole process from go to woe from the first audition to the finale is about nine months wow. so it's like a real food date you know and you know a solid six <laughs> months of that you're in lockdown where you you have 10 minutes of phone calls a week to your family and wow. um you're stuck in a house with 23 other people who have specifically been cast because they're different to you and not just different in appearance, but different in their values, different in their psych profile, different in the way that they are in the morning compared to the evening. And, you know, we, we live in these lovely little silo bubbles of like-minded individuals where our values line up, you know, surround ourselves with like-minded people. And so I had, you know, at that point I was crossfitting every day. I was um, eating paleo. I was like, you know, glowing. I'd wake up in the morning, bounce out of bed, and I'd be like, you know, doing 50, like, 50 burpees to get myself in the mood for the day. Or that was just like, can you just shut up? You know, can you just not talk at least two hours? And like, that sort of stuff, like, it's funny, but not for six months. Mm, like, it yeah, kind of, it yeah. really makes you question what kind of a person, like, who you are and whether your lifestyle or your choices or your values are wrong as well. You know, like it really shakes you about because all of the people that were like me in the in the top 100 were gone by the huh. time that they got top 24 because I was hit. You know, hmm. they had maybe four or five people like me in the top 100 that were positive wow. outlook and all, all those totally. things. Um, and then they were just like, you know, beep, 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 you're it. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. so at this stage, what was your like? What what did you want to get out of this? What what was your sort of? Because you know, like you're in there, you're sitting there now, and you've obviously gone through this process, and it's been pretty full on, and now it's getting more serious. And I think, okay, what do I actually want to gain from this whole experience? As the months rolled on, I realised, you know, that um, I probably wasn't coming back to school to teach the food and culture elective. Uh, but I did have an opportunity, a platform to do something within the food education, food literacy space. So in my mind, you know, you think about the way that, okay, here's a weird analogy. Um, you think about the way that Isaac Asimov wrote um, science fiction. You know, it was kind of based on the things that were familiar to him, but kind of like fashioned up a little bit. Or you look at Back to the Future, for example, and, you know, like that's very 80s, but mm. future is futuristic. So in my mind... I kind of had this vision that I wanted to create a, a vehicle to teach food education. I was going to create a bus. It's going to be called the Food Buzz. Uh, it's going to have big glasses on the front and it was going to have a kitchen garden on the top and it was going to go from school to school and, um, you know, a kitchen on the bottom and teach kids about food, you know, one Ooh. school at a time. Cool. <laughs> really cool. And, you know, and I think that especially, you know, when I say months rolled on, it got harder and harder. Like my body just was not handling the um, stress. Um, the food was completely not the sort of food that I was used to eating, the, the hours. You know, we didn't know what time we'd wake up in the morning, let alone what we were doing for the day. So that wow. level of cortisol release all the time really takes it out of you. So part of what I would do to kind of try and keep myself sane was I would draw this food bus. Mm. Um, and I was like this gorgeous, you know, illustration with the glasses and everything. And I just like add little details to it to keep myself focused on the goal at hand. And I remember uh, my season was lucky enough to go to Italy. That was the top 10. And I was rooming with Deb, who was the older um, yogi kind of earth mother type. And she said to me, Alice, you do know that the food bus is just a vehicle. Um. You don't have to have a physical bus. It's just a mm. vehicle. And I was just like, oh, bang, mine. mine, mine. <laughs> Holy shit, Deb. <laughs> and so, you know, at that point, I realized that I probably didn't need to think about getting a combi. I needed to think bigger. <laughs> wow, awesome. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Like one line and it's just like, boom, that just is like a, a vehicle. Wow. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to find out, like, 
do you guys actually eat well in the house or you know because i guess what it's like with a lot of <laughs> chefs like they don't actually dig cooking at home you know what i mean because they do so much yeah. of it as a job well i know that for myself you know if i've had a big day let's say doing cooking demos or or being out and about you know the adrenaline high. the last thing that you want to do is like settle in to cook a gorgeous vegetable stew for yourself um so you know if you want to if you want to eat well, don't marry a chef is the old adage. <laughs> um, and I know that in the house, it was certainly the same way, especially at the start, you know, when everyone was trying to outdo each other and um, we were practicing. So a lot of the produce, we had this huge pantry in the garage of fresh ingredients and, and dry goods as well. Um, and so everybody was making sometimes food all the time. So, you know, there were like wow. shitloads of cakes and like crap loads <laughs> of, you know, um, filleted fish. <laughs> you know chicken that had been broken down little like quail that had been deboned um and cooked in butter and like all of those foods are so delicious mm. and i have zero willpower and so i was just like and like you know coming from like my body was a temple uh, and that's more so because my husband Nick um, is like he the way that he eats. I think he's got quite a sensitive system. So like we just don't have shit in the house, you know. Like there's yeah. just heaps of fresh produce. Everything you know is um, cooked from scratch. And and that way, you know, when I'm going, rum, 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 it's like you know I'm eating a few extra dates or whatever it is. Whereas here, I'm like eating sticky date pudding instead. <laughs> and, yeah, like zero zero self control. Um, and so. Uh, but beyond that as well, like we had catered lunch every day on set. So it was not just like fully catered, like let's say um, you know, salads and the, the protein and whatever, but also dessert. So every single day we'd have a two-course lunch and then we'd go home and there'd just be sometimes food and everyone's out doing each other. So it just wasn't a sustainable way to eat. No way. But wow. by the end, I think that we kind of learned that we needed to just like cook some steamed vegetables and, and some like white <laughs> fish, which is so sick. So yeah. when you got when you got back though, were you were you like craving some of that naughty food still because you'd kind of gotten used to it, or were you just super happy to be back on like a rhythm of eating well? I was absolutely hanging to come back and cook my own food and eat my own yeah. way. Um, you know, I came back and you know, it's like coming in with a really regimented regime of <laughs> regimented regime, a really strict <laughs> regime of like. You know, labeled like um, I even had a blog, practically paleo, where you know we were making like with the CrossFitters mitza, which is like the mince meat base, and then like more salami and cheese on top. Like it, that, like <laughs> looking back now, that was not a great way to eat either. Let's face yeah. it. But um, I came back and I realized that I couldn't eat that way again because I'd entered into a completely different kind of career path where I needed to be open to eating everything. But it's yeah. also about practicing moderation as much as possible and and I don't mean moderation like oh I'm going to deny myself that it's more like I know that if I have um, a degustation to go to at a restaurant the next night I'm going to cook at home and it's going to be pretty simple food for my body to be able to rest and digest <laughs> I like that. yeah I can imagine I also have zero willpower when it comes to almost any type of food and I, I probably would have put on about 10 kgs in that house no worries <laughs> oh man <laughs> Yeah. It's, just like, yeah, it's sometimes better just to not have it in the house, isn't it? Like yes. instead of trying to have the willpower, you just say it's not even in the house because I know how I operate. <laughs> exactly. It's about removing the barriers. Like you've got to just make it as easy as possible for yourself to do the right thing more often. That's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So the show basically was a good trajectory for you, wasn't it? You know, you, you're not, your life now is quite insane really you know like you have you know tv shows and radio shows and books and and everything like can you just take us on that journey like how's everything changed yeah i think the show like thinking about you know was it master chef that changed my life i think that certainly master chef <laughs> master chef was like a it knocked me off my um center of gravity for a while there you know i thought it's kind of like when you finish school and you get a mark that you didn't expect to get like a mark that's much better than what you expected and so you think oh maybe i'll study medicine or, or whatever it is and then it takes you a while to go back and realize no wait i definitely want to study you know copywriting or whatever it is that you actually <laughs> want to do so for me i was really mindful when i finished up on the show that opportunities were flying my way you know and dollars were flying my way but for things that weren't resonating with me personally 
Um, and I had to consciously write down for myself, like create my own compass, I suppose, so that I knew what my path would be moving forward and so that I could be authentic to myself because, you know, I'm all about playing the long game. I didn't want to be a flash in the pan and I didn't want to use it as my 15 seconds of fame. I wanted to be able to, you know, I saw the power of MasterChef within my students and I wanted to be able to uh, harness that power in a positive way. So um, I wrote, you know, teacher but bigger on a big piece of paper and I thought about the different ways that I could utilise my skills as a teacher. Now, also, I studied creative arts as well as teaching. So my creative kind of um, the, 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 the various different modalities that I could operate within to be able to connect with people and connect them with food. So um, every decision that I've made, almost Pretty much every decision, I'd say. I had to think back just to, just to make sure. <laughs> Pretty much every decision I've made has been like, does this fit in with Teacher But Bigger in some way? You know, whether it be uh-huh. my book, which, you know, Alice's Food A to Z is literally a textbook for kids about food, but it looks like something really fun and accessible for them. Um, my show's Kitchen With, for example, it's a quiz show for kids about food um, where I just, you know, I'm wearing fluoro clothing and I've got sh- shitloads of makeup on but I'm still a teacher that's in front of a bunch that's of kids cool. and crunch time again you know it's about teaching kids to um, take control and have fun and you know explore new things find try new hobbies new sports and um, new dishes as well and um, even when I was food editor at the weekly review you know that role people might look at that and say how's that teacher bit bigger but at the end of the day you know um, Judy from Glen Iris my kind of target demographic there first of all she's got kids But second of all, you don't stop learning when you get to a certain age. I think everybody has the capacity to learn and everybody's got an inner child that wants to explore new stuff. It's just about tapping into that. And I think that um, I've been really, really kind of, um, what's the word? I've been really purposeful in the decisions that I've made and why I've done it along the way. Hmm. Ah, It's so amazing. the, The thing that I hear there is the visualization like did you do you t- find that an important part of your life is to to plan and visualize what your future is holds for yourself and do you think pe- that's important for people to do yeah you know it's funny like if you if you met me or if you spent any time with me you'd be like wow she's pretty ad hoc like i'm a very i'm like yeah we'll just do the thing um but i'm a very strong believer in the universe and, and in manifestation so um you know there's no way that when I was thinking six years ago that I wanted to create a food literacy program that would be accessible for the entire country, there's no way that I could have imagined what it was going to look like. And phenomenon to me is the physical manifestation of that, you know, and it took a shitload of work and it took a crap load of, you know, chutzpah um, (laughs) and sacrifice as well. Um, But definitely visualization and manifestation was a huge, huge part of it. Yeah. I'm just it's amazing like the maturity you had you know when you came out of it to go cool I'm playing the long game Uh, Mm -hmm. it must have been so tempting though to take some of the cash like you know where did this long I mean you know did did your parents teach you a lot about this as well you know Um, how to plan your life I guess you know Uh, I think that I think that my, uh, you know, something that that we didn't really talk about in my childhood, but um, my uh, um, grandparents, the ones that moved to Israel, they actually ended up here um, under quite unfortunate circumstances. They they came for a visit and my grandfather was, you know, a couple of days before they left, um, he was hit by a car and he was um, left paralysed. And so they moved in with us for, you know, 14, 15 years. Um, and so I grew up, um, with, you know, grandma and grandpa in the next room seeing, um, the fact that, you know, in a heartbeat, you know, your life can change, um, and seeing the way that they just worked through it and, you know, continued to love each other, continued to try and strive to, to be better people and, and all of those things. And I just think that I've had really tremendous role modeling. Um, and I've also, I've just kind of had a, a value instilled in me that every person has the capacity to 
you know, go beyond their limitations in, in whatever shape they, they want that to take. So, you know, I think that that's you know, talking about the way that we are built as people. That's just something, you know, that's why I'm a big risk taker because like, okay, what's the worst that can happen? Put it all. As my yeah. grandmother would. Yeah. So um, that's something, yeah. And, you know, my parents as well, everything that they do within their roles, like they, they've supervised, you know, um, let's say 50 odd PhD students between them. And, all, and those, each and every one of those students can now go on and, and teach people and, you know, do incredible things. Like, you know, half of them are in Silicon Valley doing cool shit. <laughs> so they had a, a, you know, a former PhD student over from um, the States who's working for Google. Like, you know, wow. so I just, um, I think I've been able to be surrounded by people who are always striving to be better. Cool. Wow. Your positivity is is genuinely infectious, though. It's it's really amazing. What what is the role of what is the role of food, and why is food such a good vehicle for education, and why must kids learn about food in general? Well, I think that ultimately food is the great equalizer. We all have the uh, well the necessity to eat at least three times a day. And I think that um, every time that we choose what we're putting in our mouths, we're making con- we can make conscious decisions to be more sustainable, be more ethical, um, be kinder to our bodies as well. You know, I think that um, something that we need to teach our kids is that, you know, it's not about energy in, energy out. It's actually like, what are you doing to nourish yourself um, from the outside in and the inside out as well? Um, you know, when they talk about the gut brain connection and, you know, food for thought, all of those at Apple a day, all those expressions, like they're, they're actually, they've got some truth to them. Like they've, they've come from somewhere. And I know how I feel when I'm eating well um, and when I'm moving my body. And I think that that's something that, that every child deserves to learn um, in order to be the best that they can be. So I think that for me, food is just a lens, but like, my husband Nick, um, he, he's an osteopath, you know, who's um, worked with mm. professional golfers, and he developed a program for young golfers to like to learn to understand their own biomechanics. Um, and Nick actually left his osteo practice to project manage phenomenon. So together, you know, our ethos kind of combined to try and encourage every kid to recognise that they can take control they can break free of expectation because i think that unfortunately what happens and especially with you know something like vegetables kids are taught from a really young age that they're not supposed to like vegetables and whether that be a conscious thing that their parents do because they themselves didn't like vegetables back in the day and they just expect that their kids don't or whether that's something that uh, they're affected by their peer group who kind of you know make them think oh no vegetables aren't cool or whether that's something that the media perpetuates because who benefits from that who benefits from kids thinking that vegetables aren't cool? Because those people are making squillions of dollars. Yeah. So it's not an accident, you know? And I think that, like, we need to actually teach kids that they need to, like, wake up and get the heck out of that matrix because the longer that you're yeah, just a consumer, it. that you're just a zombie, the, the yes. less time that you have to spend to, to actually contribute and be conscientious. Yeah, that's amazing. Do, do you find that what you teach the kids sort of flows into their sort of family life. So where this is also coming from is that we often hear that parents are like, no, we don't have time to cook. And, you know, that's why we just feed them like ready-made meals and, and whatever, like or fish fingers or easy stuff. Is this having an impact like from what you can see? Totally. And again, you know, talking about narratives that are perpetuated to whose benefit the greatest lie that we have been told in the last sort of, let's say, 50, 60 years is that convenience food is cheaper and takes less time because you can feed your family for, you know, pretty inexpensively and you can do it, but you just need to prioritise it and find the time for it. You know, my my parents both worked tirelessly um, and we very much, we definitely didn't have any money um, but my mum would make, you know, a big pot of borscht on a Sunday night and that would be our afternoon tea every day after school, you know. Um, and, like, you know, from the age of sort of 12, 13, 
like no one ever told me to get out of the kitchen. So I was mm-hmm. just in there experimenting, you know, and some of my proudest kind of first dishes were things like little chat potatoes with like a slice <laughs> of like melty cheese and some like dried chives from a little jar. And, you know, like I think that if I, if somebody had told me, oh no, that's not, you know, that's not gourmet or that's, that's not healthy or any of those sorts of things, that would have intimidated me and it would have stopped me from just experimenting. So that's something that I would really urge people to think about is the kind of language that we use around food and especially around kids with food. Mm. I love that you're teaching the kids from or, or helping kids from a young age understand the value of food because I think that's probably what, in my opinion, what it comes down to is like if one of your values is to spend time with your family and to nourish your children, then why wouldn't you make extra time to do that? It, it, if you don't have that value, you don't care. But these kids will grow up understanding a little bit of that value and hopefully – like understand, okay, th- this is something I need to prioritize. Exactly like what you both said is it's about the prioritization, isn't it? Jeez. Mm. But also I think that unfortunately there's a real disconnect. You know, there, there are a lot of skills that are missing. And I think that for a lot of people, they don't know where to start. So I think that the best advice that I have for those people is that there's never been a better time to seek out information, you know, online, um, go to the library, Um, If you don't want to invest in a cookbook, go to the library, borrow a cookbook, um, have a look through it to get some inspiration and just start from there. And, you know, there are ways that you can buy fresh food in a more inexpensive way Um, by, you know, going on a Sunday afternoon to the market, for example, when the food, the fruit and vegetables been reduced, Um, making friends with your fishmonger and your um, butcher so that they can give you the, you know, the off cuts or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, making friends with people who have chickens, <laughs> who have access to any of those things, make that happen. Look at the bargain basement stuff, but don't buy too much of that stuff as well, because obviously, you know, we get tempted when we see the stickers saying, you know, this stuff's half price, um, know how to store it. So if you're going to buy two or something, maybe freeze it for, for later. Um, all of this information is accessible online. There are also fantastic initiatives, like for example, Oz Harvest have the you know pay what you can kind of um, supermarket that they've opened recently. There are these incredible community grassroots organisations that are coming to the fore to try and make it more accessible. But I think that um, unfortunately, what happens in this space a lot is that people. Um, are made to feel like they're not enough and so they just never know where to start. So whatever you do, even if it means sitting down and eating dinner with your kids once a week, hmm. that's that's a start. You know, whatever. Hmm. Just one step. Eat the elephant one bite at a time. Yeah. <laughs> I absolutely love that. There's so much so many value bombs in what you just said there, seriously. Like, Boom. Uh, Boom. Yeah, thank you. It. Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> just, <in a> <laughs> uh, just, just kind of before we we finish off, um, we can't uh, finish without talking about how we actually found out about you. And that was through one of our previous guests, Diane McGraw. And Yay. you and <laughs> Diane uh, met, uh, I don't know if you met recently, but you did a talk recently uh, on sustainability, I think. And yeah, we just saw her post something on Instagram about it and we're like, ah, this sounds like a really interesting lady we'd love to speak to. So, so yeah, thanks. I to, love that. Yeah. I, hope, I hope I've lived up to expectation. Uh, well, it's funny, oh. you know, <laughs> you guys, um, it's funny, Diane and I actually met um, very serendipitously her friend, Jonathan Pangu, who's a friend of our mutual friend. Um, he's created something called Death to Nuggets. Where, so he was an ad exec um, for like a top, kind of advertising agency and he's decided that he's going to kind of utilize those all the dark magic and encourage kids to eat less processed food so obviously Jonathan and I get along very well cool um however um so at one of the dinners that Jonathan had Diane was the guest speaker and when he told me about this incredible kind of um potential astronaut who you know talks about sustainability I realized that we needed to have Diane as one of our guests on Phenomenon. And I've mentioned Phenomenon a couple of times, but to kind of, you know, um, it's Phenomenon, but with an M at the end. So like nom, nom, nom. And <laughs> then it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's phenomenon.com.au. Check it out. 
um, globally and it's all free and it's a teacher toolkit that uh, makes food literacy accessible to everybody. And what, what it does is it um, helps every teacher, regardless of what subject they teach, whether that be English, math, science, history, art, uh, whatever it is, find opportunities to slip food into Man. their lessons. Um, and so as so, part of that, we use Diane, right? You can see how that's like full circle shit, right? Yeah. Um, and so as part totally. of it, you know, we had to have Diane to talk about sustainability. And we knew that because we're talking to eight to 12 year olds, you know, we, they didn't need another grown up kind of talking at them saying, you need to do this or you need to do that. Um, we knew that it needed to be something that was quite kind of out of this world. And yeah. so we took Diane and one of the kids who's one of the stars of the show, Maddie, uh, to a space simulator, a Mars simulator wow. uh, that just happens to be in Victoria and um, sat them down and Maddie asked Diane a bunch of questions about what it's going to be like to live in space, what food waste is, you know, how we're going to avoid food waste in space, um, what it takes to actually grow a vegetable hmm. when you get there, all of those kind of, you know, key themes. And from that, we've taken a bunch of lessons that teachers from science, to um, you know, creative writing, you know, to all the way through to um, a media class, you know, all of those sorts of things that teachers can then utilize and show the video as like a bit of a springboard. So yes. cool! It's one of the coolest things I've heard. Is like <laughs> food is this thing that binds all of us, maybe more than any other single thing, and one of the most enjoyable things. And I think it's, and we can all relate to it. Like, how cool is that, that you could be sitting in maths or whatever it is, and you can just relate it back to something that it's so relatable. So I think it's just, Absolutely. yeah, what an awesome thing. And then to have someone like Diane on uh, on the back of that, it must have been just so much fun as well. Jeez. Yeah. Well, I think that the other thing, you know, selfishly from a teacher's perspective, it's always important to find really um, handy hooks that students are interested in. And I have, I'm yet to find a person who doesn't want to eat delicious food. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. delicious might mean something different to each person, but they want to know how to eat deliciously. So food, sure. like if, if somebody said to you, hey, what do you reckon a carrot's going to taste like on Mars? Yeah. <laughs> like, of course, you're going to go, ooh, tell me more about that. You know, <laughs> yeah. so it goes both ways. So using um, an English lesson to teach about food is awesome, but also using food to connect a student who might not necessarily be interested in English into that class is pretty freaking cool. Yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah. Wow. Cool. So what, uh, what exciting things have you got coming up? <laughs> um, well, at the moment, um, we're kind of wrapping up Phenomenon and we're looking to figure out where to next. And I think what we've realized is that this methodology, which we've developed, which is that idea of episodic learning. So taking video as a bit of a springboard at the start, like a five minute video, and then creating lessons around a theme can um, extend far beyond what we've created for, you know, in, in this case, vegetables. So obviously we'd love to work on more projects in this space, uh, but we'd like to be able to expand it to include movement and, and more of like the, the, the health aspect as well, but also things like, you know, helping kids to grow empathy and to, to build resilience and to understand, you know, um, their own philosophy and figure out who they are, you know, as, as whole human beings. You know, we talk a lot about mm. interpersonal skills and how we develop that. I think that we've got a real opportunity with technology to be able to teach kids outside of the classroom as well as inside. You know, you might have heard of flipped learning, which is where students can can learn stuff outside of class and then they come into the class and sort of ask the teacher the questions that they need to and it moves the conversation along along a lot faster I think that you know the opportunities for teaching in the 21st century are limitless yeah and it's a really exciting yeah. time tell me about it yeah yeah we, 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 more people could just be more excited about the prospects rather than the problems hey jeez <laughs> Well, I think that the, the thing that keeps me drive, driving forward and, and optimistic is that the research that we did as part of the project did a lot of kind of generational theory analysis. And the number one kind of takeaway that, that we took away from it is that the generation coming through are more inspired and more willing to break free mm -hmm. of the bullshit that we've been letting rule our lives. 
for however many years and you've seen it like Gen Z have so much capacity and so much potential so I'm really hopeful yeah that's a great way to look at it for sure definitely um also if you if you do ever need someone that's a movement specialist one of our previous guests a guy called Daryl Edwards like that's literally what he does. He's called the primal right. mover, and he and he he's actually oh, yeah, his, course, his latest book is is about animal moves, and I think that'll tie nicely with kids, so we can always introduce okay. you if you want. Thanks, please do. So, um, what's uh, just before we kind of uh, wrap up here? What's the best way for people to get in touch with you to find out more about you, uh, etc.? I am all over the internet as Alice in Frames. Yeah like the glasses so it's like alice in chains but frames or frame love if it you're Spanish. Um, so yeah check it out that's, 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 that. that's so cool so we put a lot of like show notes together alice and we'll put all your contact details and social media handles and everything on there too um and just just before we say cheers i just like to say just a massive thank you for coming on the podcast it's been so inspiring just listening to you talk you know and just see like this charismatic and energetic side of you come out and like i mean i guess that's what it's always like um and i can imagine that just makes kids want to learn and want to know more and it's such an important thing in this day and age you know to arm our kids with uh you know good knowledge and uh good education and what you're doing and your whole story has just been so interesting and like it's just really, really fascinating hearing like where you've come from and, and what you sort of have done to get to where you are now. And uh, yeah, you certainly have like motivated me um, in many ways. So thank you for being so honest and uh, so fun on this chat. I really, really enjoyed it. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been lots of fun. <laughs> and just briefly from my side, when I was hearing you talk now, especially just at the end there, and I was just thinking how inspired I was when, when we spoke to Diane and, and now just with you again, just that there's such powerful, amazing people out there. And like, you know, just chatting to you put such a amount of energy into us, you know, and we're so like happy that we are actually doing what we're doing. Cause like how amazing is that we get to speak to people like you. It just makes me feel so grateful. So thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, we, we can't wait to see what, what comes from you next. And uh, thanks for spending the time with us and getting us very inspired. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Well, I think, I mean, like coming back to what I said, you know, you're the product of the people that you surround yourself with. And it sounds like, you know, what you're doing with this podcast is that you're giving people access to the right kind of people to surround themselves with. So keep up the good work. Mutual Appreciation Society right here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thanks so much. <laughs> cool. All right. All right. Well, just big quickly, yeah. uh, what is the use of language that, that for, I mean, I've heard of alliteration, but what would you call phenomenon? <laughs> what is that term uh, for? It's a portmanteau. So it's um, putting two words together to make a new word, I'd say. Brilliant. Probably. Yeah. I'm so grateful. You see, I love that. It's actually a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, okay. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank Great you so setup. much. Brilliant. Thank yeah, you yeah. so very yeah. much. Really cool. Thanks yeah. so much for coming on our podcast. Yeah. Really awesome. Hey, you're welcome. And, cool. you know, if you're ever in Melbourne, don't be a stranger. Yeah, no, I think, I yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Excellent. <I'll> look- <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thank have you, a good yeah. one. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air, stop at the toll.